So thank you all to those who have joined us. So far, and welcome to the Sussex Data Science Meetup. So the meetup's sponsored or um, organised by a few different organisations here. So we've got the Data Intensive Science Centre at the University of Sussex, which I belong. We have Mojik, who helps sponsor the meetup. And we've got Colin Hayhurst, the CEO of Mojik, on the call now. So Mojik are a, a new search engine which do not track you on like Google. So if you're looking for a search engine with uh, prioritizers as privacy, then go ahead and pick up Mojik. Colin, I believe you had a few words to say or introduce Mojik. Uh, I think you've probably covered it. I mean, we're, I guess I mean, those who are technologists were be interested to know we're a completely independent company so we don't use any tools from or infrastructure from any other companies so it's been built from the ground up we uh, we've got everything apart from our own, data, our own data center but we've got our own data center room in a green data center in, in kent uh we've got users across the world in every literally every country um and yeah we've we've been not tracking people from the very beginning so we we have a we have a you know that's kind of core to our principles and we've we've got uh, paying customers on uh, on beta now for contextual advertising, uh, search advertising, which they can do do directly with us. And we have an API as well, which we've got uh, a number of companies using. Brilliant. That's it. Thank you very much, Colin. And then lastly, but not least, we've got Silicon Brighton who helps support an awful lot of the meetups in the Brighton tech area. Um, and I'll hand over to Steve Rack now from Silicon Brighton to tell you more. Cheers, Peter, uh, and hi everyone. Uh, yeah, just, just following on from Pete, I just want to just say uh, yeah, thank you for everyone for joining today, uh, and especially Max Spiros. Uh, so great of you to, to come along and provide us with so much of your time. We really do appreciate it. Uh, if it's okay, I'm just gonna I would like to provide some of you uh, who are new to us uh, with a bit of background to, to Silicon Brighton. Uh, we're a community-led initiative to support digital growth across the South Coast. Uh, so we began uh, just over a couple of years ago now by working with local tech groups to help raise their profile and provide individuals, just like everyone here today on this call, with uh, free opportunities for networking, training, upskilling and development, uh, really to try and help everyone benefit through the sharing of expertise and, and forming new connections and partnerships, so important at the moment. Uh, so to date, we've run and supported over 150 events, uh, given a platform to hundreds upon hundreds of speakers to, to share their knowledge. Uh, and yeah, just I hope everyone enjoys today's session. Uh, and I'd like to say that we're really keen to hear from anyone watching who wants to explore how they can contribute more to the initiative. Uh, that could be speaking at an event, that could be maybe helping us put together a workshop or even starting your own group. Uh, if you head along to our website, it's siliconbrighton.com. Uh, and from there, you can also join our community hub uh, and you can reach out to myself, Grace, James, BB, any of the team. Uh, and yeah, that's just enough from me. Uh, thanks again, Pete, for the time. And uh, yeah, look forward to today. Brilliant. Thank you, Steve. And so you've got a QR code there as well. Which you can scan with your phone, which will take you straight to the Silicon Brighton site. And there's a few other QR codes across the slides or the upcoming slides. So get your phones ready. Okay. And then DISCUS, which is the organization I'm part of. So that stands for the Data Intensive Science Center at the University of Sussex. So this is a research unit split across the schools of maths and physical sciences and engineering from, and informatics, from which both Max and Spiros are from. So what we do as a research unit is, is we provide, or we're gonna focus on machine learning and data science, but we also provide business and community engagement opportunities. So that could be things like hack days for project exploration for companies. So you've got a kind of blue skies idea that you want to explore quickly. We can help uh, engage with you on that and get students together and run it as a competition or a kind of focused hack day over a day or two. Um, we also act as a research partner for grants such as Innovate UK. We can provide traditional consultancy and another popular opportunity is student placements. And that can be both at the MSc and PhD student level. And you've got the QR code there which takes you to the Discus website if you want to learn more. 
And one other thing I wanted to point you towards today is the new RISE initiative. So it's an initiative run by both Brighton University and Sussex University. And the aim is to try and help small and medium sized enterprises and provide some kind of fully funded research led advice and innovation support from both the universities. And that's focused on businesses in the West Sussex area. So that's an emphasis on rural West Sussex, coastal West Sussex and the Crawley areas. And all SMEs from across the region are welcome to join the network. So if you want to learn more, you can go to the QR code and you'll find more information there. And yeah, if you know any other kind of small businesses that fit that criteria, then please pass on the, the link to them. Okay, so that's enough from me. So I'll be handing over to Matt shortly to um, talk about a really interesting topic, or well, certainly for me anyway, and that's controlling energy storage and photovoltaic energy in residential buildings. So it's very topical given the recent COP26 conference, uh, the huge spike in energy prices. So Max is from the Department of Mathematics, Sussex, and Spirius from the Engineering and Informatics Department. And they both work together on a Innovate UK project with a few other uh, renewable energy companies. So I'll stop talking and I'll hand over to Max. Thanks very much. So let me make, see if I can share already. Um, oh, I can't share at the moment. Um, oh, fantastic. Okay, so I hope that everybody can see my slides. Um, yes, so this is um, a talk Spiros and I um, give together because uh, we have been working in this area for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And how this is going to work is that I will start talking, and Spiros is uh, I will talk about some math, then Spiros is going to talk about um, some power engineering, and then I close the loop by coming back in at the end again. So in fact, this is the outline of the talk. You see the structure, so I will talk about one and three, and Spiros about two. And um, at this point, I should already extend an, um, an excuse to all of those who know optimal control quite well. So I will start really, very basic, um, repeat the, um, or start from the beginning. Uh, so some of you may already know what I'm going to say, but I think, I hope it's still for the benefit of um, other people listening. Um, and then once we understand what this the theory of optimal control is, which I think is a shared theory between the mathematical and engineering community, um, uh, Spiros will talk about this in the context of energy networks. And then finally, we come to this Innovate UK project, um, which Pete just mentioned, um, where we look at um, energy storage and PV in residential buildings. Okay, so what is optimal control? Um, what we do is we look at um, a system and the system uh, depends on time. At, at each point in time, it will um, have a certain state um, and which we now call S, S of T. Um, and that state can be different things depending on the context you're in. I'm going to give a few examples on the next slide, um, but when we are talking about energy system and storage, that can simply be the, state, the charge level, the, the charge state of your battery. And that of course varies over time. And now you can influence the system and the parameters which you have to influence the system, they are called the controls. Um, and I'm going to call them alpha. And so you, you get a certain relationship. Um, so you, you see here my graphs. Um, so we have here on the, on the right side, we have here a, um, a state axis and a time axis. And you can see here a green trajectory. That is how my state changes through time. So I'm starting um, at some time T0, um, examining my system at a position x0. And now the shape of, the, of this um, green trajectory depends on how I choose my control, how I decide to influence my system. And so I choose here my control, and you can see that it's also a time-dependent function. So for example, I might decide to charge my battery or to discharge my battery. And um, that is, of course, something which will depend on the point in time in which I am. Um, OK. Uh, so here, let me give you a few examples just to show that this is a very general framework. Um, it's quite important in finance. In fact, a lot of um, financial mathematics you can think about within the setting of optimal control. So you could, for example, ask, how do the stock prices behave? And then there would be um, 
influenced by the volatility. And so the volatility um, controls the behavior of the stock prices. And so you see already an important lesson. Control can mean different things in the context. It can be something which you control or it can be something you are exposed to. So you are exposed as an investor to the volatility in the stock markets. But if you're a chemical company and you have a chemical process, then you might be able to control the temperature in which this chemical process takes place. That would be your control alpha. And that there's maybe then a resulting chemical concentration. And that is then um, the state S in that example, for instance. And historically quite important are um, all kinds of application around um, aerodynamics. Um, there's been a lot of an initial investment into optimal control theory within that um, area. And you might have an acceleration which you decide and that will determine your position of your flight object um, S at some point. So we have this relationship and now we choose our control alpha, but by which principle do we choose it? And um, for that, we have um, a cost functional. And throughout this talk, I will call it uh, J. And so basically, if you remember the, the previous slide, we have our initial time and we have our initial position and we choose a control. And depending on those choices, I will have a resulting cost. So you can see that here. We have got our, the time at which we start observing the system. We have got the position at which our system is at that moment. And then we have the control we select and all of those things together, they will give us a cost. And we want to minimize the cost. Um, and so the, the cost can be quite general. So in the case of finance, that might be really a cost in the sense of pounds, but in other cases, it might be how far we, a measurement how far we deviate from the desired flight trajectory. Should also say that there's an underlying mathematical equation here, which does uh, describe the relationship between the states and the controls. Um, and then we, we say we have found an optimal control if, let's call it um, alpha dash, if that is the control for which the cost is, um, well, for which we can't find a lower cost. So we have uh, the cost linked to our alpha dash. And if there's no other control which is better than that, then we, we say we found an optimal control. And at that moment, now you know what um, the field of optimal control is about. So all the problems you find there, they fit into that framework essentially. So we now know what these problems are, but um, they can be quite hard. So we don't yet know how we should solve them. And um, so mathematically, there are two big theories there. There's the theory of uh, the so-called Hamm and Jacquie Behrman equations. And then there's the um, uh, Pontryagin maximum principle. And historically, they both go back to mechanics. So the Hamilton and Jacobi, you see in the name, is the Hamilton and Jacobi, you know, maybe of Hamiltonian mechanics and also of Hamilton and Jacobi mechanics. And that was developed around 18, in the 1830s in the same way that Hamilton's equations of mechanics. And they are in some way the godfather of the Pontryagin maximum principle because mechanics is a special case of optimal control. Um, and this, this mechanical theories, they were taken as a basis around the 1950s to, um, to develop, to extend this to optimal control. And in the US, this was done by Richard Bellman, which then gives us the name hamilton jacobi bellman equation. And in Russia, this was done by Pontryagin, um, which also, um, I should say, shows you the, the, the times of the Cold War here. And basically all the theories of optimal control, they either are based on what is here on the left or on the right, or they're solving the original problem as it is, I showed you before. Now, what's the benefit of this? Um, well, I'm going to um, talk with you about the Hamm and jacobi behrmann equation more in this talk. That's really what we mathematically use. And <clears throat> so let me give you uh, um, the, the basic idea of this. And um, to understand that, let's look at this, examine this using an example, um, just driving around in the UK. And uh, when we drive around, around, around we go on, um, on paths, on roads. These are the trajectories. If you remember my first picture, I had this green line. This would be the road you were actually driving through, the, um, through England. So our state space is the map of England. And we have controls. That is what we do on the steering wheel or with the accelerator, the brake. These are the controls we have available. 
And um, we have also cost in mind. So usually we want to get somewhere as quickly as possible. So the cost we have is the driving time. And so it's an optimal control problem. And now what we can do is we can fix a point or, um, on the map. So it might be the University of Sussex. And then we um, check for each point on the map how long it would tell, uh, take us to drive to the University of Sussex if we take the best possible way. So then we get, if you like, um, a, a, a function, a graph superimposed to the map of England. And that graph, the height of the graph, shows us how long it takes us to go to our destination. That graph, that function, is called um, the value function. And that value function is not really the, is a fundamental, fundamentally important object mathematically. Um, and the reason for that is, and that is really where this Sam and Jacobi Bellman, or in short, HTB idea comes in. It says it is a universal equation, and um, that equation characterizes, describes the value function. So you've got one equation of, of one structure, and um, with this one structure, you can basically um, use it for all kinds, almost all optimal control problems. This is here in sort of an example of how this equation looks like. It's, an H, it's called the HEB equation. The important thing is it always has the same structure, in the, regardless of how your original optimal control problem looked like. And even though this equation is really difficult, um, mathematicians have been grinding on that equation now for <laughs> 50, 60 years. So we have got very strong and powerful tools in order to deal with that. Um, just to give an example, in the early 19th, uh, 80s, there was a paper um, on the theory of this equation. It was the most cited paper in mathematics three years in a row. Um, but there has been throughout very active development. And so this makes it a powerful tool. If you have got a problem to describe with very complicated nonlinearities, because they're basically, you replace your complicated system by the system of the Behrman equation. And that's difficult as well, but it's really well understood. And so HEB is, is um, excellent if you need reliable control for complicated systems. And that's really why we are talking about it today. OK, so maybe just say what is on the fundamental level my contribution. One I want to point out is there's something called finite element methods. These are very um, widely used computational methods to solve differential equations. And I proved with my co-author Ian Smears in uh, 2013 the first proof of convergence for um, these M and Jacobi Behrman equations. Okay, and um, now of course this talk is about applications. So in a way now um, I say it's enough of um, talking just about math in the fundamental sense. And there are of course different um, application areas in which you can apply um, M and Jacobi Behrman equations. Here are a few on which I personally worked. The one we focus on today is energy storage. Um, and really the background is that um, modern energy infrastructure becomes, um, has many optimal control problems, but it's also becoming more and more complex because the, the, the um, components within modern energy systems get more complex. But at the same time, you need to be reliable. You can't um, over simplify or over linearize your systems. So you need a theory tools to deal with this nonlinear structure. And that is really where the Hamilton-Bury Behrman equations come in as an very uh, important tool. And with that, I now would like to hand over to Spiros, who is going to explain to us more about um, power engineering and electricity networks. Uh, Spiros, to you now. Okay, thank you, Max. Um, so, the, uh, so my focus is gonna be on um, uh, in innovative control approaches to um, elements in electricity and well, in energy networks in general. So uh, if you move to, to the next slide. Um, first of all, I, I'd like to say that uh, it's not only about energy networks, uh, uh, but the um, energy networks are part of, of the, uh, any nation's critical infrastructure. And uh, these um, uh, energy networks are, are linked to other networks such as telecommunications, uh, water networks, transport networks, so, so it's not a standalone system, um, and this makes things uh, a bit more complicated. Uh, but at the moment, we're, we're focusing uh, mainly on electricity, really. Um, so if you move to the next slide. Um, 
Now, in, in when producing uh, electricity, we essentially we use generators. Um, generators could be um, any form of generator. It could be a large power plant in, um, in the Midlands, or it could be a very small um, solar photovoltaic on someone's roof. So um, traditionally, it's been the former, uh, but nowadays we see more of the latter. So nowadays we, we see more, more and more small local generators uh, being connected to the system. Uh, and that's great because many of them are actually solar or uh, wind, um, wind turbines and uh, basically renewables. But this causes um, an issue with the, um, with the operation of the system because um, network operators are used to having maybe a hundred or a few hundreds of generators connected to their system. So they can actually um, uh, even physically call them, you know, with a, on the phone and tell them, you know, I need a bit more power. Can you supply a bit more power? And then, yes, okay, um, they, they supply a bit more power. But um, that's not really feasible if you have one million generators connected. If everyone has their own um, photovoltaic on the roof and they connect it to the grid, no one can really call a million people. So you need a kind of a more autonomous and um, uh, aggregated system to kind of um, control these large numbers of generators. And aggregation is kind of at the core of, of um, what this research is about, because um, we um, the concept is that we we aggregate large number numbers of generators into what we call a virtual power plant, and uh, by applying techniques such as optimal control, which Max uh, just explained about, we can actually control large numbers of generators and uh, make them behave just like they, they, uh, as, as if there would be um, one large power plant. And the operator, the network operator can just um, communicate with the aggregator, which is a separate entity and tell them, you know, I need that much power. And then the aggregator takes care of the rest, uh, coordinates all the millions of uh, resources to achieve that. Now, if we go to the next slide, um, you'll see that there are different stru structures of um, virtual power plants. Um, this, for example, is, an, is a, a hierarchical structure. So um, where you have um, levels, layers of aggregation, which could be first at the neighborhood level, then at the city level, then maybe at, at the country level. Uh, so um, if, if you move to the next slide, um, you will see that there are different approaches to actually controlling those resources. Um, uh, and these are, I should say, these resources are not just generators. They could be energy storage devices or electric vehicles, um, uh, which is this, this particular example. And uh, you can control them either centrally or um, uh, with a de decentralized system. A centralized control means that you have to um, optimize and uh, derive all the control, control signals from a single point um, from the central aggregator. Um, but a decentralized approach means that the uh, decisions can be taken um, at lower levels of aggregation or even by the units themselves. Um, and it's kind of a mixture of those two that we, we worked on with, with Max. So if you go to the next slide, uh, you'll see um, uh, something uh, the basic structure of what we call intelligent agents. Uh, I suppose since this is a, um, a data science kind of forum, many of you will probably know what an intelligent agent is, but for those of you who don't, it's essentially a semi-autonomous or fully autonomous um, piece of software, which um, has a certain behaviors. It's derived from the object-oriented programming. It's, it's called agent-oriented programming. Um, and uh, by um, uh, deriving cert certain behaviors, it behaves almost autonomously and uh, responds and learns from the environment um, uh, that it's, it's located in. And it, of course, communicates with other agents um, through a, a, a certain communication channels. So the next slide um, 
is about uh, applying this concept to um, uh, aggregators, um, sorry, uh, ag aggregation of uh, energy resources. So um, there are mainly two types of agents. Uh, one is the, um, the agent that is allocated to each of the resources, each of the generators in this example. And this agent controls the generator. It knows every, everything about the generator. Um, it is able to control certain parameters of the generator and, um, uh, and provide signals to reduce or increase, uh, sorry, um, yeah, uh, increase or reduce the, uh, the output of the generator uh, according to um, what is necessary. And of course, we have the aggregator um, type uh, of agent who um, uh, perhaps does um, uh, optimizes um, um, certain parts of the of the system and sends uh, signals to the the other agents to act um, in a certain way. Uh, so that's the kind of the, the basic uh, concept. The next, if, if you move to the next slide, please. Uh, this is what the interaction between agents typically looks like. Uh, and this is a fairly standardized uh, structure. It's it's um, um, it's basically a, um, a, um, a communication uh, protocol, um, whereby they, uh, one of the generators uh, requests. It's it's for trading mainly. Um, so one of the agents uh, requests something from the other agent. The other agent either refuses or uh, provides an offer. Uh, then the other agent, uh, the first agent, uh, may reject or accept the offer, and uh, they either um, agree or agree to disagree, uh, um, and the transaction falls through. So the next slide um, shows uh, part of the, the decision-making uh, process that um, I've implemented in, in one of those examples um, in the past before we set up this project. And this was with um, uh, fuzzy logic. So basically, um, and this is the part that where the, the agents actually learn about the environment. They, um, they, they keep track of the prices um, and, the, um, uh, and the load uh, in, in kilowatts or kilowatt hours. Um, so, uh, and they, um, they have a, an appreciation of uh, whether an offer made by someone was uh, by, by, by another agent was um, um, good or or a bad offer for them, and using something I, I um, kind of uh, described as an in insecurity fa factor, I won't go into, into more detail. They uh, they basically decide they use these two to decide if they're going to go ahead with a transaction or not. Um, now, moving on to the next slide. Um, this is uh, essentially um, the, the, um, the interaction of the whole system. Um, so where you see the, uh, the aggregator agents to the right, uh, the virtual power plant agents actually control the trading, um, the, the, the system of trading. And they um, they give signals to the uh, to the individual generators, and um, uh, and then um, uh, if they're satisfied that the uh, the controls are um, adhered to, then um, that's fine. Otherwise, they will um, uh, send more signals to actually change the um, the output of the of the overall system. So that's how more or less the uh, the aggregator controls. Um, the individual generators or the individual resources to provide an overall uh, average power output that is um, uh, acceptable. So the next slide, please, uh, uh, shows the um, uh, the results of this control. It's within certain boundaries. So um, because we have a diverse system of um, of micro generators or or resources in general. Uh, there are limitations, so the, you, you can't really go above and beyond uh, the capacity of, of the generators to provide power. Um, but within these margins, you can uh, control the, the system really effectively. Um, 
And uh, coming back to optimization, this is definitely a suboptimal system, but um, it is uh, uh, a way to optim sort of optimize it and control it uh, um, in, in, in an effective way without uh, having a, a centralized supercomputer or something like that. That's the main advantage of this approach. So uh, if you move on to the next slide, please. Um, we, uh, the, um, so far I've, I've been talking about energy and electricity mainly um, uh, as, a, as the, the commodity or the, 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 um, the target to be optimized. Um, but um, as I said in the beginning, the uh, electricity is just one of those systems. And um, uh, a large part of the, the energy uh, research community is looking at how the uh, uh, electricity systems interact with other systems like, uh, like the gas network or um, provision of heating, uh, because heating is obviously one of the largest sources of, um, uh, sorry, largest um, things of of, um, uh, of energy. So the, the, uh, most of our energy is actually consumed for heating um, uh, our homes. So, um, so someone actually came up with an idea, which is, they, they called it energy hub. It's basically um, where um, you have inputs and outputs the inputs are the uh, incoming energy uh, types of energy, the um, carriers of energy, as we call them. And the outputs could be um, also carriers, but not necessarily the same. So, for example, if we have natural gas going into a, um, a small generator, uh, which, which is the, uh, of the type uh, called uh, combined heat and power generator, um, it is generating electricity, but at the same time, some heat which can be used in the home. Um, so, um, and you, of course, you have the, the electricity input from the grid. So the question is, which one do you use? You have in pretty much every home, you have electricity and gas, or in many of, many of the homes, you have electricity and gas coming in. So if you have a, um, a small CHP, a combined heat and power generator, um, how do you decide if, if you use electricity from the grid or if you use your own generator to actually do that. And that's the essence of the control problem of this particular project that we worked with, uh, with Max. Um, now, uh, moving on to the next slide, um, the, uh, the definition of the, the energy hub is basically a unit where multiple energy carriers can be converted, conditioned, and stored. Um, now, storage is an important point because it in, uh, introduces a lot of non-linearity, uh, uh, as Max um, uh, mentioned before. And that's a problem for um, many of the uh, optimization techniques that have been used in, in the field because they, um, they could uh, kind of handle a little bit of non-linearity, but not... Um, that much. Um, and um, I think that's one of the main advantages of what we did with, uh, with Max in this project. So moving on to the next slide. Uh, the system is described by um, uh, some coupling matrices. So um, not going into a lot of detail, but basically we have the outputs and the inputs um, on either side as um, uh, 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 as, you, as you can see, but uh, and these are linked by what we call a coupling matrix, which um, links all the different inputs, input vectors, to all the different output vectors, which are not necessarily the same, um, through a certain um, conversion factor, or um, or uh, for that matter, nothing at all, because if we have natural gas coming in and it's not being used at all, then of course we, um, um, uh, we're not going to have uh, natural gas as the output. So um, yeah, so this is, this is the system. And um, uh, if you move to, move to the next slide, please. Uh, we considered the energy hub to be essentially the household. And we considered it to, be, to contain uh, different uh, elements 
um, either uh, generators or batteries, um, more specifically batteries. Um, and um, now, before we started working on the project, we uh, um, uh, I, I kind of focused on, on um, uh, combining the agent-based control approach with the uh, the energy hubs um, uh, optimization uh, approach. Um, it's not an elegant approach. Uh, it kind of works, but uh, it's not a mathematically elegant and um, uh, robust approach. And you'll see that if you move to, to the next slide, you'll see that this is an algorithm that um, uh, controls this system where you have um, um, the hub agent as uh, one level of aggregation, and then you have upper, uh, higher levels of aggregation. And the question then becomes how, how you optimize locally the hub, because you can't really optimize the whole system at, at the same time, how you optimize locally the hub and also uh, stick to the requirements of the, the, the higher levels of aggregation. Because uh, sometimes um, it may be uh, optimal for locally for the hub to actually consume only gas, for example, and no electricity, and produce the electricity through the um, 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 for, uh, an individual generator, but it may not be uh, the, the, the best approach for uh, the centrally for the, the aggregator because maybe um, they think that gas uh, is in limited supply, which has been the case in recent weeks, I would say. Um, but, um, uh, uh, you know, th there are different objectives in, in the aggregators and you have different aggregators. They could be either commercial or technical. So there could be technical limitations to not being able to consume more gas. So um, there is in the middle there, you might see a, um, a sort of modification request box. And this is when um, the optimal um, uh, the optimal uh, solution for the individual hubs conflicts with the um, the overall objectives of the, the aggregation system. So then the, the central aggregator uh, sends a modification request and essentially asks the, uh, the individual hubs to go with a suboptimal solution, okay, which they've already calculated um, in the step with a, with a red arrow. Um, uh, I should say. So, so that's the step where the hubs optimize themselves internally. And, uh, and then if, the, if a request, a modification request is received from the, the main aggregator, then they have to go with a suboptimal solution or impose certain constraints. So the next slide, um, uh, please, um, describes the, uh, the interaction again I'm not going to go into more, into uh, detail. This is pretty much the same as as a, uh, the other uh, uh, set of interactions. Only in this case, we have um, the hub uh, specifically um, doing um, the the uh, optimization and then um, potentially receiving a modification request and trying to kind of uh, negotiate with the aggregators and the individual agents. So. Uh, next slide, please. Then this is uh, sort of the um, the central, the uh, kind of abstract, if you want, um, objective function, the, the thing that needs to be optimized. This is kind of the utility of the agents, um, where um, utility means um, uh, any sort of objective. Um, and in this case, the, the, the utility of uh, uh, the overall utility of the agents is that they, uh, they minimize uh, the, uh, the use of, um, of the cost of energy, so the use of energy by focusing on the cost. Or another objective is uh, emissions. So you could minimize emissions. Um, but this is um, uh, shown by, by C, uh, the factor C, which is the cost factor. Um, and and of course the uh, the coupling matrices and the um, um, the uh, the individual energy carriers. So this is the system to be optimized. So moving on to the next slide, um, 
this is an example of a small um, system. Uh, in this case, it's not a household, but it could be maybe a building, uh, a residential building, um, uh, an, uh, an apartment block, for example, uh, where you have a photovoltaic, a wind turbine, a, a fuel cell, which is producing electricity, and a small uh, micro turbine. Um, so um, the next slide actually shows the, uh, the results. Sorry, one moment. Yeah. I wanted to change the name of the, of the PDF for a second. No worries. Um, so, the, um, so you can say that um, with, uh, by, um, by doing some fairly rudimentary optimization, um, without the, the method that uh, Max kind of, uh, uh, brought into, into the system, we can have some uh, reduction of cost and emissions, uh, a few percentage points um, for the overall system. And the next slide shows also the, the reduction of cost um, uh, when a, um, a deviation is requested by the aggregator. Um, because uh, without getting into much detail, the, um, the energy markets uh, have a, a mechanism where if, um, uh, if a generator um, uh, kind of promises certain outputs and then does not necessarily deliver, then they, uh, they have to go to, uh, to other generators to actually um, compensate for this. This is called the balancing market. So that we ensure that you know, they, they, the customers are always supplied with enough electricity. Uh, so instead of going to the balancing market, the, the virtual power plant can actually have has the flexibility to modify the, um, uh, the combination of generators or resources or energy storage devices that actually provide or consume electricity and energy in general, um, because this is a, a more generalized system, uh, and reduce the costs, um, the overall costs to the system. Um, so. Uh, if we move on to the next slide, I think um, that's my, my last slide. So I will hand, to, um, hand over to Max again. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, yeah, thanks for explaining all those things. Um, and now I'm, uh, so Spiros again described things um, quite broadly. And now I'm going to focus specifically on this project for which uh, Spiros and I, or I should Spiros SPI, got the, we got the funding. Um, and that is controlling energy storage in multiple forms, MPV energy in a residential building. Um, so the, this somehow happens at two levels. We have got a specific case study with um, the, our collaborators, which were to, it was together with Durham University, but in particular also with Moixa and Sunem. Um, Moixa produces um, electrical batteries and Sunem uses, uh, produces thermal storage, a thermal battery, you could say. And um, you get here this um, cartoon of a house where you see we have here this electric um, battery. This is here Moixa. Here is Sanam. This is a storage of um, heat. And then we have got a photovoltaic cell. And they all together are in this residential building, which of course is also consuming energy, uh, electric energy, thermal energy. And it's also connected to the grids and can get external sources of energy. And it has to now manage optimally um, when to charge, when to discharge, and also, for example, when photovoltaic energy comes in, should that go into the electric battery or should it go into the um, thermal battery? That decision relies on information. It relies on predicting the future. And one important component here was that we are linking this up to the cloud of Moixa, who have got an engine and predicting all kinds of um, future information, future um, energy price forecasts, uh, weather forecasts, all that information, uh, consumption forecasts, which can be then used uh, in that optimization um, system. Um, so this is this specific case study, um, which we also then in a lab um, analyzed and built up. Um, but there's also a general framework which goes beyond the specifics you saw on the um, previous slides. So where you could where the idea is still that of a residential building, but you could have a different setup in terms of the um, number of um, energy carriers, number of 
uh, storage devices and so on. Um, and here you see now um, the, the main set of equations, if you like, um, which we use to work with. And specifically here, what is um, what we wanted to include are important effects of storage degradation, conversion, efficiency, and safe discharge. Um, because they are important. If you want to understand the, the margins, if you like, the financial margins can be quite small. And in order to really understand whether you're having a profitable strategy or not, you have to have a good understanding uh, of the uh, precise effects. Um, for instance, these batteries can be very expensive. And every time you go through a um, charge and discharge cycle, you will degrade the battery a little bit. We all know that from our mobile phones and uh, from our laptops and so on. Just these batteries are much bigger and so a lot more expensive. And if you go through a lot of charge and discharge cycles without really gaining a big, big advantage, you might actually um, save less money than the loss in value of the battery. So you have to be very careful in keeping track on that in order to make profit. In the same way, whenever you move energy around, you will have um, losses through conversion energy. And then uh, if you talk about storage, then the the, um, the, the storage devices, they can lose charge. So for example, the thermal battery, it loses heat. You can't have the perfect uh, storage of heat. Eventually there's gonna be some leakage. So we take all of those effects into account and they are nonlinear. So I've indicated here, color-coded that. So you see here red, green, and blue. And you see then here also certain boxes in red, green, and blue. And they just give an indication of what the effect is. Um, so this is here again, our cost functional, these are here running costs. Uh, this has to do with energy consumption. This is here, um, I think, safe discharge. Oh, no, so it's, yeah. And uh, so you see how these different effects come together. Um, and we saw, and so this was the system we had to solve. Um, now, there were really two objectives here. The one was you want to have a system which is a standalone system. So this is going to run in the customer's home. The customer has no understanding of the engineering of um, these batteries, has no understanding of optimal control. So the system has to run and there can't be any disruption. So it has to be robust. At the same time, we had very limited computational resources. So all of our resources, all of our computations were implemented on a Raspberry Pi, which is a very um, low cost computer, which you can use as a controller um, on um, batteries, for example. And so we uh, numerically solved this HEV equations, which I introduced back then, using a so-called semi-Lagrangian scheme, if you like to know the um, technical jargon. Um, so on this Raspberry Pi controller, um, and that brought in a number of advantages. So, so firstly, um, I would call it linearization free. So we are really solving the original problem. We are not solving an approximation um, to it in the sense of changing the um, the nonlinear structure of the problem. Um, it's computationally efficient, which uh, links now back again to the computational resources available to us, and it provides um, globally optimal solutions. And maybe I should go back to that and explain a little bit the problem. So here, if I go here back to the previous slide, that is a system you could think you directly solve it, so you don't go to this HGB way of looking at things. And that is valid, but it will give you an optimization problem, which is non-convex, highly non-convex. And it's very easy then to find um, wrong candidate solutions. So you find something which looks like a solution, but it's not. It um, just has certain properties of it. And um, with our approach, we are really having a guarantee of finding the globally optimal solution. And we also have a nice theorem, which looks a little bit technical here. Um, so we have to discretize things. Of course, time is a continuous object physically, but on a computer, you have to break things down into discrete steps. And um, the effect of that, bringing it down to um, discretizing the problem, this is all well controlled. So we have here a very nice theorem, um, which says we are guaranteed to approximate the right object. And we can get as close to the object we want to, um, the, the true solution as we like. We just adjust our um, discretization parameters accordingly within the limit and we can do that within the limitation of what the Raspberry Pi is able to deliver. Um, now what's really what's then the coming out of that it's all nice as a theory but of course you want to actually um, 
change the, something in the real world. And so here you see two um, computations. That's done at a it's it's a computer simulation of what would be happening in a house in Brighton. And once using the existing te technology, if you like, of the or the um, the original um, ways the batteries operate, they do have some basic optimal control already included. And then you see here our system. And um, now, for example, the blue graph. I hope you can see my mouse. Um, if not, please let please shout. Um, then you can see that here the charging, this charging is a lot more aggressive in the original way of doing the optimal control. We are a little bit, we are not just a little bit, we are significantly more um, cautious in trying to find the optimal way of dealing with this. So we don't charge fully and we don't, then can, um, uh, for example, avoid unnecessary discharge. And with that, we can achieve an up to 29% reduction in cost. So that would be a Brighton household in summer. In winter, that would be significantly reduced just from the way um, energy is available. But in summer, that would also correspond for the reference household of 20p saving per day, which does add up if you think about a 10-year, 15-year investment. Um, this has been, as I mentioned, has been also tested. So this is not just a computer simulation. This has been done with real batteries uh, and real circuits and real consumption. And um, the, um, I should also say that, so this we, we um, focused here on cost savings, but you could also adapt that quite easily to other services where you try to deliver, as Spiros mentioned, there's the, the question, can you deliver a service to the overall network? And um, you could try to implement that, changing the cost function. In fact, uh, linking also back to things uh, which th things we also create, uh, explained before with aggregation, you can um, think of extending these ideas by bringing um, together multiple households and um, dealing with the fleet of um, these domestic um, or these residential hubs. And there would be different ways of dealing with that. So um, we have been um, discussing that in two um, ways, but outside of this particular Innovate UK project, we have been looking at fleets of batteries in the context of mean field games. That would be a statistical limit. So you, if you if you know continuum mechanics, continuum mechanics is taking the limit of saying you've got more and more particles in your material. You can in the same way say what happens if you've got more and more storage unit and you take the statistical limit of infinitely many storage devices in some kind of normalization. And that leads you to mean field games, which again bring to you mathematical um, efficiencies. And another aspect is machine learning. And this is something we are starting to look at now. Um, and I just want to, um, I guess, close this talk by um, explaining this and what the connection is. And in particular, I'm linking here to reinforcement learning. And it has a good reason why you link to that part. But what is reinforcement learning for a start? It's a part of machine learning and it's um, learning optimal strategies by um, having the machine learning algorithm interact with their environment. Now, if you look at the sentence here, if that was my um, possibly simplistic definition of what reinforcement learning is, there are two keywords here, optimal strategies and interactions. And it's just maybe a different way of saying that interactions you can translate as controls. And uh, because controls is how you interact with your environment and optimal strategies might be just saying you're minimizing a cost. So it turns out that reinforcement learning is um, in some way is um, solving an um, optimal control problem. But more specifically, actually, so what happens is that um, in, in uh, classical optimal control, you would represent the relationship between controls and state through a given equation. So the equation is a container of information. In machine learning, you typically have a different container of information, which is a large enough data set. Now, firstly, you understand, um, you can translate the two different types of containing information. You can take a data set and you can try to, by regression or similar tools, bring it to um, an equation, or you have insight and knowledge about the structure of the data set. And, um, but you can also use an equation to create a data set. Um, and at that moment, you see that um, these are really two different sides of the coin, but abstractly, you're always looking at an optimal control problem. And so it turns out that actually most reinforcement learning algorithms explicitly, also if you pick up the textbooks, they will say they are solving a Bayman equation for exactly that reason. It might notationally look a bit different. It might have different properties because you're dealing in the language of data, but on an abstract level, it's the exact same thing. 
And, um, but of course, when we move to machine learning, we get access to deep neural networks and they allow us to, they have got very nice approximation properties. And from that, because of the approximation properties, that's the key thing we try to pick up at that moment of all the different things machine learning can do. Um, we, we can look either look, um, considering multiple um, storage devices or more complex storage devices, where I think we at the moment um, are looking more, starting to look more at the complexity. But I should say, and I think that's maybe also quite important. I mean, machine learning is, of course, um, a big buzzword at the moment, but um, I would uh, advocate that it's not a replacement of the, the other methods and nothing comes for free. So why we got um, with the approach I showed to you now on the Raspberry Pi semi scheme, we get a very good control. We know how good our solution is. These um, guarantees um, would be very difficult, I would say, with current state of understanding of knowledge, impossible to gain with this machine learning approach. And of course, when you deal with energy, when you try to um, leave systems to their own devices, maybe in people's household, this reliability is an important aspect. Okay, and with that, I'd like to close um, the talk. So thank you very much for your attention. And um, Spiros and I are um, happy to answer all your questions you may have. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Max and Spiros. That was a really interesting talk. So if you've got any questions, if you want to put them in the chat. Um, and meanwhile, I've got to, I'll get a start a question just to get started. It's, a, it's quite a more a general question in terms of you talked about how you can organize these agents hierarchically in a way sort of like, you know, deciding what decisions get made based on, say, like the distribution regions or per household. I was wondering if you could maybe mention or go through the pros and cons of going through that approach versus, say, kind of time of use tariffs, say, like Octopus Agile does. So the kind of decisions are all made at a household level based on the tariff. Well, it's not entirely different because um, if you consider the um, the time of use tariffs, um, they're basically um, what is provided. It's the environment, the environment. Um, so, um, and then if you if you have, uh, then, it, then it depends on what controls you have locally. So, if the environment is basically the time of use tariffs, then um, you might have a simple switch to switch things on and off when the time of use tariff you know, comes on, or you might have a machine learning algorithm or um, a Hamilton, Hamilton Joko with a Bellman solver to, 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 uh, to do the optimization. You know? so, so, um, and that's the, that's the local uh, level, and that could be either um, for a single uh, energy storage device, or it could be for a few storage devices, like we did with with um, Max in the project. So, to some extent, it's not very different. Uh, but um, I assume that you're you're referring to um, uh, basically price signals going into people, and, and uh, I'm not familiar with with uh, the system that uh, Octopus have installed um but it's uh, is it uh, an automated system or is it just um real-time pricing so it can mimic real-time pricing so they give you a half hour time of use for each day going forward for both import and export okay and i guess my question is more in terms of going forward for the grid you know dealing with say that like, more renewables and you know more load versus you know ev cars and heat pumps whether just having a time of use cost tariff is going to be good enough? Um, yeah, it depends what you want to achieve. To achieve. It, it, it is a start, it's a good start, um, and it may kind of provide benefits. Um, but then if you want to, um, to really op optimize the system in a, in a much better way, I mean, there are not too many things you can do for for optimizing the system you can maybe delay your the charging of your electric vehicle but and and your washing machine but there's not uh, an awful lot of things you can't do um in the household and and that's why um 
smart grid, sorry, smart meters uh, have been useful, but not, you know, the most useful thing in the world. So, um, so I'm kind of digressing real, really, but uh, the point is that, um, uh, yeah, it, it depends on what controls you implement um, uh, locally and, and um, how you um, um, how you actually use the resources that you you have uh, connected to the system. So so locally, you could have um, an automated system which could just simply uh, receive a time of use tariff, or you could have a more um, complicated aggregator um, because essentially Octopus in that sense are, are kind of takes the role of the aggregator. It sends signals to, to uh, the devices. Uh, and these signals could be simple, a, a simple price every half an hour, or it could be a more complex signal of do this for half an hour and then do that for another half an hour. So, um, so yeah, you, you could evolve this system. Um, but the time of use is, is, a, is, a, um, is a simple signal where you can, you can build things in. Uh, so for example, you can make it really expensive um, to, uh, to produce, to consume electricity at five o'clock in the afternoon. And then everyone actually responds to that. So, you know, um, yeah. You know, thank you, Spiros. Um, so I know Colin wants to ask a question. If you want to go ahead, Colin. Yeah, so it's a question which maybe valid in the applications you looked at, but I guess in general it would be a question which you could answer, which is like how an approach like yours with a kind of what I call a robust mathematical approach as, a, as opposed to reinforcement learning, um, I guess in all these you know, physical systems, I think about problems I've worked on in the past careers where one of the key things has been the assumptions about parameters in the physical system so i guess in this case it might be the heat conduction uh, heat parameters of the you know uh, the, the 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 thermal devices and the battery the batteries and so on so i mean um you know you could you've, you've done some calculations there and i guess they to some extent those how good those calculations well will depend you know, probably in some cases very very little on how good those assumptions are for those parameters and and, and then sometimes they might uh, have a big effect um, so I guess, um, you know, I mean, do, what comments do you have on that? You know, sort of, um, uh, could you, you know, I, um, yeah, what, do you think uh, the reinforcement, reinforcement learning approaches or the approaches like you're using will be a better way of, uh, in, I guess, in actually trying to figure out what those those sensitive parameters are? Because, you know, if you can uh, um, figure out them more accurately, then you're going to have obviously more robust and more useful uh, model and, and system. Okay, so I think um, that um, if you so if you look at the at the chain of tools we are putting together here, um, it's true that the arrows add up, and you always tend to look at the at the dominant arrow. There's there's an arrow which is connected to um, to describing your, your your parameters. So you maybe have a process like the degradation of your battery or um, the energy conversion, and there are certain models, but um, all models are limited in the end. So there will be certain things we'll neglect. Um, and that there, there's this error. And then there's um, the errors which arise from our numerical methods. Um, and because uh, all numerical methods are um, having trade offs. Now, there's one class of methods which the one we used, where we used the semi Lagrangian approach. There's the other class of reinforcement learning. They all have um, errors. And um, now I think you had got different parts in your question. The first one is maybe what's the trade-off between what's the choice? At which moment do I want to use reinforcement learning? At which one do I want to um, use a traditional approach? And um, uh, in which sense are they different? Um, the the, the trade-off is, I think I have to, when, when we talk about the trade-off between methods, um, reinforcement learning versus the sort of more classical schemes, I think um, th there's what is theoretically possible and what do we understand at the moment. So I think I have, I'm optimistic that a lot of these error bonds can be further improved in the future for methods like reinforcement learning. 
and um, they will get closer in terms of the guarantees to what the traditional methods can do. And that would shift the balance more towards them. But I think we are still some, some a bit away from that. So the, right now, the, um, the trade-offs come when you look at complex systems that the similar corrosion schemes become more computationally more expensive much more quickly than the reinforcement learning methods. And there's, there's a threshold at which the similar corrosion schemes are just not computationally feasible anymore. When the energy cost of the computation is more than the energy you're saved, you know that you're doing something wrong. Um, so I think that is answering another part of your question. If I, I believe there was a third one is, can you use these um, computational tools to analyze which parameters feeding into your model are the most important ones? Exactly. Um, I think you can, uh, so we have not done that. Um, I think you would um, probably do that by, so I think um, it's, it's part of, of a different ingredients you need. So you need these methods. And I think either of them are probably at that moment suitable for, for that task. Mm -hmm. um, because at that moment, you will just be able to throw a lot of computationally effort at them until you, they do a co computation um, well enough that you feel confident that you trust that result. Yeah. So in that sense, I don't, don't see there the difference. Um, I think one of the um, main new things you have to bring into the mix is a representative set of scenarios because what the most important parameter is might depend very much on your situation so somebody sitting in brighton in summer might um have completely imp uh, different important parameters than somebody sitting in scotland mm -hmm. in winter because in one case i guess the photovoltaic in scotland in winter is completely it doesn't matter how well you model it the energy <laughs> output is not going to be very high um so but for somebody who has got a lot of energy coming in for the photovoltaic these parameters are going to be really important so i think that will be then an ingredient which we have not considered at all um I, but i think once you have that available so you once, once you can get hold of that bit of information i think there would be a solvable problem if, if that makes yeah. sense yeah thanks that's great yeah okay so we've got another question here we'll probably make this the last one this was from Vladislav in the chat. What are the benefits of choosing a sub-globally solution because of the CA stroke TA request? Does the solution affect all the child nodes or just the one requesting it? So um, the, uh, the CA, the commercial aggregator or the technical aggregator request is a request <laughs> that is coming from um, uh, that might might come from a um, uh, a need to actually do that do do something. So, for example, the uh, the commercial aggregator might um, decide that the the actual output of the of the, of the virtual power plant, the overall um, aggregation uh, system, is not enough to actually supply what has been promised. Um, or the technical aggregator might decide that actually the output, the overall output of the of the combined uh, generators, actually violates some technical constraints and might cause a, a fault somewhere in the in the electricity network. So um, so in in some way those requests are not really negotiable. The, what is negotiable is what you do after that. Um, so. Um, so you either kind of uh, modify your um, your system so that it is suboptimal but feasible, or um, uh, you kind of uh, work out uh, another optimal point, um, which is well to, to some extent it is still suboptimal. Um, so technically speaking, there's there's no benefit to um, to uh, either approach because the approach is not negotiable, really, um, if that makes sense. Brilliant. Thanks, Spiros. Thanks. OK, well, so th thanks again, both of you, for the really interesting talk. I'll just Thank finish you. by grabbing the slideshow and just going for the last couple of slides to finish off. So just to point you to a few uh, Silicon and Brighton events coming up in the new year. So we've got the Brighton R meetup, which is on the 20th of January. That's between four and eight o'clock. 
you've got Brighton Cloud on the 13th of January, which is six to eight. And then you've got the Brighton Data Forum, which is a sister meet up to this group. That's on the 26th of January, four to eight. And now we had Colin, uh, Oscar on the meetup. I don't know if you had any words, Oscar. Hello, thank you. Uh, we are actually reconsidering uh, which um, uh, we're actually reconsidering meeting in person uh, next January. We may uh, choose a different speaker, just different events. So, so we'll have to keep have to keep you posted uh, as as the day approaches. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Oscar. So you've got the QR code there to scan. If you want to go straight to the links to those events as well and sign up. And then just the last couple of slides. So this talk will be going up on YouTube on the Silicon Brighting YouTube channel and added to our playlist, the Discus YouTube channel. So follow the QR codes for that. And then just to point you to our next meetup talk, which is going to be on Thursday, the 17th of February at 4 p.m. Again, probably remote on Zoom. This one's from Merrin Evans, who is a PhD student uh, or particle physics PhD student at Sussex, but he's also part of the DiscNet PhD program, which one of the things DiscNet is involved with in terms of organising PhD placements. So he'll be talking about one of his placements where he's been working for a company to look at how data science can help widen the university access. So that'll be another interesting meetup. So please sign up to that now. And, and that's it. Have a great Christmas and New Year and hopefully see you in February and stay safe.